network neutrality from architecture to norms. Uh, I am Luca Belli, I'm, I work at Sarsa, Sorbonne University in Paris, and I'm also um, serving as a um, Council of Europe uh, expert of network neutrality. Uh, this workshop today is uh, aimed at highlighting several of the facets of the network neutrality debate. Um, as the title suggests, network neutrality is uh, from our, the internet architecture, links the near internet architecture to normative concepts. And today to explore these various facets of the network neutrality debate, uh, we have a, a group of distinguished panelists. Uh, so I will uh, start from my left. We have Jeremy Malcolm from uh, Consumers International, Frédéric Donc from the Internet Society, uh, Michele Bellavite from uh, Telecom Italia and Etno, uh, then Ellen Broad from the International Federation from, of Librarian Association, Roxana Radu from the Graduate, Graduate Institute of Geneva, Borami Kim from Netro Neutri Net Neutrality User Forum of Korea, and then uh, Parminder Jet Singh from ICT for Change. Uh, we will start with a brief uh, uh, keynote by Borami Kim, and then we will uh, continue with an interactive, hopefully, uh, discussion uh, with our panelists and with the audience. So if at any moment, if you want to provide your inputs, your standpoint, please just raise your hand and you will be able to participate in the, in the discussion. And then at the, when we, the final stage of this uh, workshop will be an open discussion when you will be able to pose directly questions to the, to the panelists. Uh, so please, uh, Borami, uh, you can start with your keynote. Thank you, Luke. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Borami Kim uh, from Naturality user, uh, Net Neutrality user from uh, South Korea. Uh, Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce myself and uh, um, and net neutrality user from. I have been a lawyer uh, for nine years in the field of ICT. Uh, one of my expertise is consumers' collective action. Uh, I also advise uh, many civil societies regarding consumer rights. When we Koreans first faced the issues of blocking and VoIP, mobile VoIP, um, we just thought it could be solved very easily because we have very strong regulation about telecommunication. Uh, we have a classification uh, about common carriers. So we expected the authorities to take uh, appropriate measures require the mobile ISP to comply with their duties of their common carriers. Um, but we couldn't get uh, expected, and we couldn't get the expected uh, replies from the authorities. Uh, so moreover, the authority denied our request to have access to the information regarding the neutrality policies. And this is a making process they explained that is in the scope of their discretion. So users don't have any right to have access to the information and this is a making process. In this situation, we had to respond collectively to accomplish our goal for um, coalition uh, and net neutrality. Uh, it had become clear that net neutrality problem should only by our own hand uh, users action. Last year, uh, for at least one year, we had made three educational public lectures and 10 times open seminars and four times legal actions against governments and telecommunication companies, 12 times press releases to educate, promote, and 
ensure the end user's right in public. And finally, in this October, the government releases the draft traffic management guidelines that we have argued and insisted upon. We think this is a small victory along the way. Uh, however, uh, we forum still think just uh, the existing telecommunication laws cannot completely guarantee the net neutrality principle. There might be always another possibility for relating re violation by applying the existing law arbitrarily. So we have to focus that our daily experience in the internet all over the world and first uh, and find out the common principles to facilitate it. Every day we can experience free and decentralized ways of communications and, and users uh, can choose the ways of communications. We can point out the enabling fundamental pillars to enabling this experience the internet protocol and or internet architecture. But who knows, internet architecture, internet protocol may change or in evolve in quite different ways from present forms. However, uh, if we hope to see the future internet development in a more de democratic ways, we should uh, ensure and the user's right as a fundamental right. Net neutrality can be relevant to some of the human rights, uh, such as the privacy, right to privacy, freedom of speech, access to information, access to the internet. Uh, but uh, we thought it is, we don't, we don't think uh, it is sufficient. Last year, the Korean Human Rights Commission publicized that the neutrality issue uh, part of access to the internet. Uh, neutrality um, can be a human right as a fundamental ways, uh, but we have to uh, develop a little more detailed concept of end user right. Actually, uh, we prefer about that the concept of human right relating net neutrality. So in Korea, the forum of net neutrality uh, working for this together with the Congress people and we could make uh, some framework regarding model law for net neutrality by end of this year. Thank you. Thanks a lot, <coughs> Barami, for highlighting the South Korean perspective. And uh, uh, as we uh, were mentioning, net neutrality is uh, intimately intertwined with the uh, internet architecture. And so I would like to start uh, uh, with uh, Frederick, uh, that works for Internet Society and ISOC. We know that is the uh, institutional framework of the ITF that is the home of internet architects. So, uh, so uh, Frederick, uh, would you be so kind to tell us a little bit what are we speaking about when we are uh, speaking of network neutrality? Thank you, Luca. Uh, how long do I have to do that? Uh, a couple of minutes, to maybe two minutes and a half. <laughs> a couple of minutes. Be concise. <laughs> So if I succeed, uh, I will establish a new world record. Um, thank you. Um, look, so the origin of the debate, uh, so that we're sure we're talking about the same stuff, um, that is an increasing demand in, in for internet connection with greater bandwidth. I mean, we have convergent data showing that the annual growth rate for global internet bandwidth is 40% to 50%. So that means more pressure on network capacity, hence a greater deployment and use of congestion management tools. And that was at the core of the debate, is traffic management a threat to the open architecture of the internet? 
Uh, interestingly, uh, network neutrality didn't mean the same thing for different persons in the room at the very beginning. We heard people talking about price, discrimination, traffic management, expression, uh, freedom of expression, user choice. So uh, that would be interesting to just focus on, I guess, traffic management. This is what we would be talking about. And, and more usefully to try to define what it is that you're trying to achieve. And that would be what our user expectation, and that is that an internet in which traffic is conveyed in a manner that is agnostic to source, content, and destination. So for us, that means access, choice, and transparency. Um, we might need to pay attention to some terminology here. Uh, we see that uh, there are a great move from many services to IP converged platform, video, uh, voice, data, etc. Uh, so we might need to pay attention how we label this. Um, that would not be the internet. Uh, voice of a broadband or IPTV, those are not the internet. So we might also need to come back to uh, a definition of what the internet is and what it's not. Um, so key challenge, traffic management asset. Traffic management is a normal part of an everyday network operation and network management. So it's not bad in itself. Um, it's needed because congestion is a feature of the internet itself. Uh, now, of course, it's the way traffic management is being done, in which environment, whether it's transparent or not. Uh, IETF, you mentioned, uh, developed standards and protocols which are flexible and transparent. And also, uh, for my telecom friends, uh, traffic management is not a panacea. I mean, adding capacity to the network is the best way to alleviate congestion issues. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Um, so from there, I can expand if you want me to do so. I, and I will ask you to maybe to focus a little bit uh, on the European dimension uh, of these issues because you were mentioning um, IP-based network that maybe should be considered different from the open end-to-end uh, -end network. And we know that recently that the European Commission has proposed uh, a, a regulation that uh, uh, explicitly encourages uh, specialized services. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, if you can give, provide us an overview of uh, uh, the main issues, the main uh, uh, tensions regarding this uh, current proposal, the European uh, Commission proposal, uh, and what, how does it relate with net neutrality? Thank you. Yes, I mean, it, it's interesting indeed. As you know, the, 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 the Commission released a draft regulation, regulation on these issues, uh, or many issues, but those include network neutrality. So, uh, to say it in a nutshell, the, 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 there were very good principles in there, uh, especially when you see that users' our rights are being recognized and that would be free to access and distribute uh, information and content, etc. So, so, it's close to our heart. Yes, there are exceptions, and one of those is traffic management. Again, so that is cl close in the loop. Um, uh, you mentioned specialized services. Nothing impeded uh, telecom operators to engage in specialized services in Europe so far. Now it's being recognized formally in the draft regulation. Um, and yes, there are tensions, or I would say concerns in Europe, uh, especially about how would specialized services coexist with the global internet as we know is provided both are being delivered on the same physical network. Uh, so, so my personal concern is that we all will always see the internet delivered in the best effort mode. We should pay attention that it doesn't become a least effort internet. So, so it's just about how we will see specialized services coexist with the best effort internet. So that's certainly the key issue that I guess we would like to discuss I here today. I agree that uh, it is, I mean, nothing, there is nothing negative with regard to specialized services as, as long as they are uh, precisely defined and as long as they are kept separate from the end-to-end -end open internet and as long they do not hinder the open and end-to-end uh, -end, uh, internet. So uh, maybe I w it, is, it could be interesting to have a, a perspective of uh, ETNO, of some of the um, European ISPs on how uh, these um, norms, these provisions pertaining to specialized services 
and maybe also to the assured uh, service quality connectivity products that have been uh, introduced in, in this proposal. And so, how do you how do you consider this provision? Could they be could they be helpful for ISPs, or what is your opinion? Okay, I just works. Yes, um, I try to be as brief as possible. Um, I, I had some notes that I used in the European Parliament a few months ago before the Commission tabled the proposal. Things have changed a bit from that moment, but, um, but we already have a first cluster of issue around uh, net neutrality that have been solved at EU level. So I think we have a very good level of um, policy framework in already EU directives and member states law provide a high level of consumer protection. Consumers are free to access and use uh, content and applications and services of their choice. That's acquired. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, a good number of obligations defined both at EU level and at member states level for ISPs. So we need to be transparent uh, in contract terms, in terms of communication to customers. So I think the two sides of the market ISPs and consumers have a good policy framework in the EU. There is not much to do uh, about that. There is not much more to do about that. Um, the third uh, point I would like to raise is that we do have a competitive marketplace in the European Union, which is also something that is not directly related to the net neutrality debate, but once you have a competitive marketplace, if you have a problem with any ISP, you're free to terminate your contract and go to another one, which is a further level of um, which is a further level of um, protection in terms of consumers um, in terms of in terms of consumers' rights, uh, not by law but by market development, which is also good. Now, if we come to the Commission's proposal, we're happy. We're happy with it. Um, the problem we have now is that, as you know, when the Commission tables a proposal, then it needs to go through the co-legislator in the European Union. So we've got no idea of how it can come out at the end of the process. We will work on it, and we will try to get uh, as best an outcome as possible. Um, what we like specifically is that the new proposal put forward by the Commission tries to really move the net neutrality debate from a speculative and ideological uh, level to a more concrete one where consumers are totally protected, their rights are recognized and enforced, uh, obligations on ISPs are even clearer than they were in the previous framework, um, but we have a further level Basically, the provision says that providers of content applications and services and provider of communication services, so the two supply sides of, uh, of the market, shall be free to enter into agreements to deliver specialized services with a defined quality of service or dedicated capacity. That's basically what the new proposal says. Uh, we like it because for the first time we see it recognized by the institutions that we can further develop our relationship on the supply side, taking into account that within this framework there is no place for blocking, slowing down, degrading, discriminating, throttling, uh, and all those practices that we're not allowed to do. So that's, um, that's basically my contribution. We can get deeper into any point. As Thanks, as Michele. Well. And, okay. Maybe should, it is worth to also to highlight that uh, there is some room for discrimination with assured service quality for prioritization. Notably, it is that yes, is uh, yes. something that it is allowed by the um, proposed regulation, and it is not clearly defined a distinction between assured service quality connectivity product and specialized services. So that is some, something the colleges later should work on. And um, so I, I, maybe it, it could be interesting also now to understand, as uh, we are speaking a lot about net neutrality, what could be 
the 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 good the benefit of natural neutrality, especially for um, marginalized people, for uh, poor people. So uh, I will go on my right. Par Parminder, could you uh, explain us what could be the the benefits uh, of natural neutrality policies? <coughs> Yes, uh, I think first of all, uh, when I, before I speak about what could be the benefits to people in poverty and the marginalized people, uh, we should recognize that it is at that edge where net neutrality is being most violated today because they are politically weak and not organized. And it is in the developing countries, in the low end mobile market, where packages are being sold which are non net neutral. You can get few of those uh, internet applications, either for free or for a very s small cost. And, and that's where that model is being built up from. There are two benefits of doing that. One, they are not very well politically organized, so they will not know what the big issue is, and they would uh, you know, not uh, respond in the same manner as people here would. Secondly, you can always pass off as a cheaper internet. You know, if somebody is getting free or very cheap, what's your problem? Because those guys don't have money. So if the companies are subsidizing, content companies are subsidizing money, uh, their uh, connections, so what's the problem? Now, it depends on how you see what internet was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a great vehicle to democratize power and egalitarian uh, new techno structure, new communicative sphere. And uh, if you guys remember the VISIS, Declaration of principle, which says about and talks about an information society where everyone can access, create, share information, and and then to ask, do poor people even create content that they should be very worried about whether it's uploaded and given the same kind of preference? Then you have lost it somewhere ideologically, and I'm raising the debate again back to the, the ideological level. I think we need to go beyond end user right and consumer choices. There are social choices involved here. If you just talk about end user and consumer choices, those guys really don't have the time. They need inexpensive internet. Will they just take it? The point is we together, we want an internet which is inclusive of those people. Then we need to make a social choice, a social choice which is captured in public policy for higher gains, whether it means economic efficiency or not. And that debate has never shifted towards those directions. We need to stop talking just about end user and consumers and the collective requirements of uh, inclusive society. And for that, uh, net neutrality is very important. Uh, do we have a minute more? Um, 30 seconds, maybe 20. OK. Uh, maybe I'll come back to it again. There is also an issue I have, we have struggled a lot about how technical issues what we talk in IGF are perceived by social justice movements and rights movements. And I think net neutrality is always the very good translation issue. That's the key issue which from the technical realm we can translate to people who are fighting for media rights, cultural diversity, uh, economic decentralization, et cetera. And that should be spoken of, but spoken of in social terms and not in terms of technology. Rather than the best beat, uh, best effort internet, which like, what is it? We are talking about a public internet. The public internet has been saved from the specialized services one. So use those terminologies which can you know, mean things to the people we are talking about to connect with. Thank you. It's true also that what you were saying that uh, also sometimes choice is not really, consumer choice is not really the, the only option also because if you have to choose between very throttled or just a little bit throttled and blocked, uh, I mean, it's hard choice. So uh, I would like also to know by, by Ellen, uh, uh, what is important in, in the context, why and, and net neutrality is important in the context of, of uh, uh, public, public access to the internet. Hello everyone, and before I start I just wanted to clarify that I'm not an expert on net neutrality. I'm stepping in for my colleague Stuart Hamilton. So I'm going to try my best to articulate this as it applies to public access to information, and by that I mean through libraries, through educators. But please do not ask me any technical questions. <laughs> my expertise is copyright, so we can have a conversation about that afterwards. Okay, so libraries have always been interested in access to information um, and intellectual freedom. So the net neutrality debate is very central to the perspective of libraries and educators that access to information should be equal um, regardless of who is delivering the information and who is receiving the information. So the concern for libraries and for educators when we refer to specialised services is that 
the access of our users or the access of the public to information could be prioritized according to what is of greatest economic benefit to our telecom operators. And I understand that it's a competitive market and that specialized services are something that's under discussion, but when I think about it in terms of, for example, education, uh, libraries, academic libraries, uh, community colleges are increasingly looking at online delivery of courses, either recording lectures, streaming, solely online courses. And in the online courses environment, um, particularly when we refer to MOOCs, massive open online courses, we're seeing the emergence of both for-profit and non-profit uh, education options. So both Udacity and Coursera are for-profit companies and Google has just partnered with edX who are a non-profit but are going to be able to increase their outreach. And whether our students, for example, would be, it, it would be of preference to them to go for a for-profit like Coursera or Udacity because the type of service or the type of access they get through the uh, local university or through a non-profit uh, option may be, they may not be able to afford the specialised services that we refer to. So that's kind of in a nutshell in relation to the online environment. I'm happy to refer to it in other senses, but I thought that might be enough. It is, it is true that uh, by allowing uh, pay for priority, one has also to wonder uh, how can those entities, those, those public entities that cannot afford to pay for priority, how can they provide an efficient uh, quality of service. So uh, I would like to pass to Jeremy um, to have uh, uh, some um, input, some uh, his perspective on uh, how um, a neutral access, a, fr a free access to ter uh, third party platforms over mobile internet uh, can affect uh, consumers' experience and uh, consumers' rights. And um, so as you are at uh, Consumers International, maybe you could be extremely helpful with this. Well, um, I'll actually follow on from what Parminda had to say about particularly in at the region that we both live in where uh, mobile packages are often bundled with free or subsidised services or applications. And it's actually a mixed blessing for consumers, as he sort of indicated. Consumers are loath to turn away free product <laughs> at any time. Um, but the consumer movement is not for low cost at any cost. And uh, if it's going to result in a less equal network, then we have to look very carefully at it. Um, so, for example, what I'm talking about is you have free access to Twitter um, or free access to Facebook, but maybe not free access to Google+. That's just an example. Um, so, um, there are various providers who sort of compete against each other based on what free offering they have with their mobiles. And by free, I mean there's no data charge, uh, whereas normally you would have data charges for accessing other content on the internet. Um, Likewise with chat applications, um, one of them offers WhatsApp for free, another one offers Line and Kakao Talk for free. And because uh, a lot of the time this is what, this is the only experience of the internet on a mobile that many consumers have, they won't go outside of that little free uh, sandbox. And it's not to say that they're prevented from loading other websites. They can load other websites, it's just that they will then start to use up their data quota. So I think that it's a difficult question. It's not uniformly good or uniformly bad. It is certainly an infringement of net neutrality, but I think it matters whether it's achieved in an anti-competitive way or not. Uh, but I'd like your feedback on this. Um, so is the provider, is the <coughs> network provider simply zero rating the traffic? Um, and a very well-known example of that, or perhaps not well enough known, is, is Wikipedia Zero. Wikipedia Zero is a, um, an arrangement that Wikipedia has with uh, network providers to give uh, zero rated access to the Wikipedia website. Now, we're all fans of Wikipedia. We all love Wikipedia. But what if you were the, uh, if you had a website that also offered information similar to Wikipedia and consumers were staying away from your website because it wasn't free? I mean, I even though there's no commercial arrangement, Wikipedia is not paying for preferential access, it's still prioritising them over the competitors. Um, so I think where I personally would draw the line um, is on the basis that 
um, there's no payment. Because if, if money is being shifted from the content provider to the network operator, then clearly that's too far. That's a step too far. But where there is no money flowing and it's just a zero rating of traffic, well, it's questionable. Is that a, it's a strict breach of net neutrality, but does it actually harm consumers more than, more than uh, having them pay for the traffic? Yep. So let's uh, maybe we can discuss and that. Uh, Jeremy, do you, do you think that uh, further research uh, into this phenomenon could provide some evidence from some policy change? And in, in, in case you think so, how could it uh, help to have some evidence-based policies? Mm. Uh, absolutely. I mean, because a lot of these arrangements are very opaque. There is no transparency. You don't know on what terms the provider is giving you this free access. Um, is there some quid pro quo along the way? Is it an advertising deal? Is it um, they're co-locating their equipment in the um, network provider's um, data center? How does it work? I mean, I think that would throw a lot of light on the question of is this anti-competitive because where there is uh, an anti-competitive uh, element there then I think regulators have uh, a warrant to step in um, but in other in other cases um, it's not such a, a, a clear case so we need we do need to have some research and some transparency around these practices and find out yeah what are the terms on which this is happening I, I think Frederick wanted to, to reply to one of your um, comments and afterward we will have a uh, remote intervention from uh, Narin uh, Krashatyan. I'm sorry, if my Armenian pronunciation is not the best. And uh, are we are we ready? Are we ready with the remote uh, intervention? Okay. So I, a couple of replies, and maybe if in also in the room, if someone wants to add something. So yeah, no, no. I was I was interested by. Uh, um, um, the description made by mobile offers and our, well, our understanding is indeed we are talking about mobile internet which means that there are constraints, spectrum, scarcity, etc. But net more neutrality applies as well on, on mobile services. So uh, services when you need to pay one dollar to access your Facebook or your favorite uh, website and free for some, some other stuff is antithetical to the internet. It's not access to the internet. Those are data services. We need to be extremely clear about that. And on top of this, let me also add that uh, traffic management on mobile internet is even more frequent and on uh, fixed internet. As the last year a report by Barrack highlighted that uh, in Europe that it is indeed a highly competitive market. Uh, around 50% of mobile operators apply uh, throttling, throttling or blocking measures, so it's still something that extremely uh, thorny. Uh, Michele, do you want to add something? No, no, I mean, you, you, you're right. I mean, uh, talk to Skype, for example, in certain European countries, and you will see that they are being throttled and blocked. Again, when you buy a 3 uh, you should have access to the entire internet, or it remains data services, and we're not speaking about the same stuff. Michael, do you want to, do you want yes, to, add, to add something? I no, just wanted to take up on your point on the mobile segment of the market. It's totally as you say. I mean, market is really very competitive. We're moving towards pricing structures where you can either go flat or choose your data plan. Um, and take up again on the point that Frederick said, data services are not, are different from the internet two different things. One is data services, the other one is accessing the internet. So two different levels. Um, again, the point that I raised before is uh, when you do have a competitive marketplace, free to get and get another provider. You're not happy with one, go and get another one. It's also true that if both block some specific content, you can go to another one, but the content will be always blocked. As I asked, not only the competition thing, even there are five of them and do the same thing, that still doesn't offer adequate social choice. And I think we should go beyond uh, just uh, the competition thing because there are many things in which you know you can have five bad media players, all of them being bad, and therefore there's a media regulation which still says that you media guys can't just say that don't like my content, go to the other guy. You still need something which is a higher principle. So these social choices are higher than just the competitive prices.
You are absolutely right. I mean, one can tackle net zero neutrality from various perspective. Uh, especially in the U.S., they tackled it from the competition uh, principles perspective. But human rights perspective is extremely important. And by the way, uh, the report of the Dynamic Coalition on net zero neutrality is dedicated to human rights issues pertaining to net zero neutrality, and we will discuss it on Friday morning. If you are interested, you will uh, also have paper copies. And uh, so <laughs> we, uh, after the commercial, we can uh, have the uh, remote intervention. Uh, Nico? Okay, so now we can talk about Alejandro Pizanti. Okay, Unfortunately, he, he was not able to join us, but he is uh, online. And so wonderful. He, Alejandro Pizanti from uh, UNAM, uh, Autonomous University of uh, Mexico. Uh, could we have his contribution? Uh, please, Alejandra, could you could you provide us your contribution? Pardon? Do you need a microphone? Okay, we don't have we have some technical problems, so probably he will provide us his contribution in some minutes if we manage to solve this uh, technical problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, he has been throttled. <laughs> uh, so, Narini is not online, Alejandro is, yeah, has some problem. So, we will, I, I suggest to uh, pass directly to uh, Roxana's intervention. So, uh, we know that uh, uh, in order to build some efficient, scalable, uh, natural neutrality policy, regulation, legislation, whatever. Uh, we need to respect some basic principle of tran transparency and accountability in order to define the roles and responsibilities of the various uh, stakeholders of end users, ISPs. So, uh, could you could you tell us something about uh, the, ro the, the the roles the, the these stakeholders should have, and, uh, uh, and what about how could be uh, Im, uh, implemented this uh, principle of transparency and uh, accountability. Thank you. I think we can talk about transparency and accountability on two different levels. One is the design and implementation of traffic management itself, and the other one is the policy making process. Where for the latter, we usually talk about reaching a common framework by involving all stakeholders or a multitude of stakeholders, not necessarily all of them. And if we think what, uh, at what uh, Parmeter just said about social choices and the representation of marginalized communities, I think this is uh, a hot point that should be taken into account in future policies. Uh, for the desi design and implementation part, um, I think here the obscurity comes from the marketplace experimentation with imposing limitations. Um, that are either not communicating at all to, to the users or are communicated in non-comprehensible ways or partially communicated. Um, transparency refers to public disclosure, which we understand quite broadly, which should be applied in the negotiation of the policies and in the implementation itself, thus enabling users and oversight bodies, if we consider those necessary, to monitor ISP practices. Uh, based on a set of indicators that allow for minimum standards to be achieved, and this should include some uh, social standards as well, uh, while taking into, into account uh, differentiated usage, usages of uh, information packages and differentiated needs. Um, so maybe what we're missing right now is exactly this fine-grained approach to net neutrality regulation. Accountability, on the other hand, is the expectation that providers and decision makers uh, can be called upon to justify their actions. However, with net neutrality, we are always talking about very different reference frames and different understandings of which traffic management techniques are acceptable and which ones are not. Uh, so in thinking about an international framework or internationalizing this debate, I think we need to find a way to, to balance this out somehow and maybe the discussion should also touch upon that. It's indeed uh, an extremely interesting uh, input to the discussion, the fact that uh, some a framework, a policy framework 
could be elaborated according to this principle, both in his, elabor in, uh, in his elaboration process and in order to implement uh, accountability and transparency. And uh, uh, if I can, if you allow me a second moment of commercial during the last uh, three months uh, with the dynamic coalition of, on natural neutrality, we have tried to transpose the ITF process of uh, standard elaboration into policy making uh, to uh, build a model framework on net neutrality that will be discussed on Friday uh, morning at 9 at the Dynamic Coalition uh, meeting. So you are all invited to, to participate if you are interested. And uh, at this stage, I think it could be... Uh, do, you, do we have the, the remote uh, intervention of Alejandro or uh, Nareen? Okay, do you do you want to use a microphone to to amplify? No. Okay. 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 Perfect. Do we have Nico do you, do we have some question from remote participants? No. Okay. Uh, so I would like to take some uh, some questions uh, in the room. I'm sure there are uh, there are some questions. Please can you raise your hand? I think uh, Okay, ah, thank you. Uh, the, the gentleman there. Okay, my name is uh, Eduardo Bertoni. Uh, I'm a law professor at Buenos Aires University and at Palermo University. And I have a, I think it's a technical question. So it's a technical question for Alan. I'm kidding. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <it's, laughs> It's a technical question. Uh, assuming that uh, we agree on net neutrality as a design principle, assuming that we agree that some traffic management is necessary, and assuming that there are a lot of issues related to public interest and social choices in this, in this area, when we translate all of that to a concrete implementation, uh, it happens that it could, that we need somebody to control. We just talk about accountability and transparency. And this somebody could be the market or could be the state. Mm, I'm not sure if the market w will work on, on controlling a traffic management that is not abused and discriminating. So let's say that we need some sort of governmental office that will control that. But for me, or in my experience, controlling traffic management in s under or, or under some specific standards is something really complicated. And I'm not sure if all you know, the offices in development countries are able to do that in a serious way. So my question, which is technical, is, what are the best models that do you think that it's possible to implement the neutrality design principle by regulations and to have a good control of this principle uh, if we don't have good or yes capacity in, 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 in governmental offices to do so? My first reaction would be, well, let's have, uh, let's create some good authority instead of uh, no, saying yeah, that there is. But it's not just to create authority. I don't think that there's a, a lot of technical expertise in controlling mm -hmm. that. But this is my question. I mean, uh, it's but my that, experience. That, that could be my, my yeah. uh, immediate question. But I think that there are a lot of uh, answers. Uh, Frederick, do you want to start? Or Michele? Uh, you want Michele? My, my first reaction would be, please, let's not create other authorities. I guess we've got far too many by now. They could just empower some authority with some more that could be That could be a way out, <laughs> yes. Um, or I think it's, uh, again, in a competitive marketplace where we've got also competition on the content provision side, uh, let's imagine a situation like uh, it works for competition law, for example. If anyone feels his or her right is infringed, you go to a competent authority, 
you file a complaint, there will be an investigation, and there will be some sort of remedy. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think we really need, as we already have in the telecom sector for market regulation on wholesale input, any sort of ex ante control on uh, traffic management. Uh, that would be a nightmare. And I don't even know how technically you could do it. Um, but well, I... I, I, I don't know. I mean, you have a point. I do understand your question. I'm just, on my side, uh, taking, trying to suggest not to create a model where you have ex-ante control in a competitive marketplace uh, on the network operator side, on the content provision side. Uh, I was thinking like of a model that might look like that of competition law, where the market is free to go if anything is wrong because there is an abuse of dominant position then anyone who feels the right is infringed. Uh, you go, you file a complaint, and then uh, there will be a control over it. Yes, it's, it's also true that, as I was mentioning before, in also in highly competitive market as the European one, Barrack has clearly highlighted that there are a lot of infringements. So I don't know if competition law alone can be uh, used as the, the remedy. But I think Frederick wanted to add something on this. And I would, uh, and I would entirely agree with this, uh, I'm afraid. Um, you're raising a lot of excellent points. Uh, first, um, I believe, but I'm speaking now from my, uh, with a European perspective, uh, and, and I believe that those authorities exist and they are supposedly independent, and those would be the NRAs, uh, who are gaining uh, much more knowledge uh, on, on those issues uh, more and more, actually. And the Berec plays an extremely good role, and there are leaders in Europe um, among the NRAs uh, with, with a very good approach. I'm, I'm thinking of the French RCEP, who, who really understands how it works. Um, but this is not just the, 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 the regulators. Market has a role, and users have a role, and we want them to be better informed and that would make users asking questions to their ISP, saying, what it is that you're doing with my bits and my internet connection? Are you using DPI? What it is that you're doing with this? Much more transparency is needed for consumers to be truly well informed. And then, if they're not happy, competition should help them to change providers. And this is why com shows and competition are both necessary. And, and then let me, if you allow me, Luca, to expand a little bit your questions with um, not only the who, but how we would do that. And I would like to refer to some FCC very recent work that you might, uh, you may have heard of. Uh, there is um, 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 an open um, internet advisory committee to the FCC who are just released in July. Uh, an excellent paper on managed services and quality of services and what it is that we should do. Uh, obviously, we're all reluctant at this stage in the technical community to see rules being applied uh, as to measuring quality of services with parameters because it might freeze a bit what it is that we hear by quality of services and innovation in the future. So we advise that we start with the perceived quality of service by consumers to see how things might evolve in the future. So, but that's another story, and this is also the reason why I'm personally reluctant to see a legislation at national level that will freeze the definition of network neutrality and how to implement it. But I know you didn't ask, but I, I felt it was part of the broader question. Thank you. It is true that okay, there are already some really good regulators that understand what is net neutrality as RCEP. It is also true that when net neutrality becomes not only a competition issue, but also a human rights issue, uh, re net national regulators do not have, they are not competent to analyze human rights issues. So Barrack has explicitly highlighted that uh, national regulators are not competent to analyze human rights issues. They can analyze the market competition, but that is the reason why I was suggesting maybe uh, it, is, it is not necessary to create new authorities, but to extend the, 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 the range of powers and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, remedies that can be adopted by the national regulators. Uh, I think uh, there, there are a lot of other questions. Uh, the, the madam, uh, the, the lady there with the red uh, uh, scarf, Someone has stolen the microphone. 
Ah, sorry. Is there someone else? Ah, okay, sorry. Who, who is the first one uh, in the queue? My name is Christopher Yu. I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. One of the big changes in the debate is Netflix Open Connect, mm -hmm. where a content provider is essentially walking into ISPs and asking them, well, you'll either take all my traffic for free, or you will take a box and host all my traffic for free. And in many conversations I've been in, this has been a very different economic dynamic. And I'd be curious from the people on the panel if the development of strong bargaining positions by content providers against the network providers has changed the way you would analyze these issues. Michael, do you want to reply? Yes. I, 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 I will be very, very frank. I don't think we have experienced that kind of situation in Europe yet. Um, I know Orange had uh, a difficult case on terminating traffic, but I don't want to speak of any other company because I'm not representing that company. So um, I, I don't think we've, we've had that kind of situation yet in Europe. So I think we definitely have to look. It's super interesting to see how bargaining powers on the supply side can really have an effect on the downside side of the market. Um, Yes, I, in an, an interesting point to look at. I'm sorry I'm not I'm in a position to answer to you now. I, I, I think Parminder wanted to reply also. Uh, yes, I don't have an answer how to do it, but it illustrates that network neutrality is a very complex and a fast-moving area. And therefore, I don't understand how can network neutrality be applied without a regulator of network neutrality. Because you have to first have a very exhaustive legislation but this is so fast changing an area that it has to be constantly be interpreted in that particular situation like the one you have mentioned and actually see that the market operates in the terms of the larger principles which are written in the legislature and it cannot be enough that you just have a legislation and you have a reactive kind of filing which would not be adequate to many new of situations so there is some interpretative power which only a regulatory authority can use and in this on this issue, there's a problem because a lot of countries, a lot of groups don't want to give this power to the telecos, teleco regulators. Mm -hmm. And they have this old telecom versus internet psychology uh, issues uh, that was also played out in the wicket. Uh, and we said net neutrality is a big issue. So who's going to deal with that even at a normative lab level? But don't touch IT, uh, ITU because it's telecom mentality, which is fine. And that happens even in national regulation systems. But then if the telecom regulators are not doing it, then who does it? And that becomes an issue. And I think some regulatory authority is needed. And without that, uh, net neutrality doesn't mean anything, really. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think there was a question. Uh, the, ge the gentleman there, uh, can we I'll bring the mic? Sorry? Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I can madam. also echo what the gentleman just here said, that we've seen that same phenomenon within Australia. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Narelle Clark, I'm president of the Internet Society in Australia and I mm -hmm. also work for the Australian Communications Consumer Action mm -hmm. Network. But I'm an engineer of some standing, so... <laughs> I've, we've also seen that situation where you have um, a large content service provider come to a large telco ISP and say to them, host our box for free or else cop our traffic come across your transit links. And that's not a great bug because, because the situation, it costs money to host stuff. You know, it, it costs money to, to pay for those links. And that, that cost is going to be borne by the consumer ultimately. So there needs to be somewhere, some way of coming that, bringing that through. Um, the original point I wanted to question I, on, I wanted to pose was that years ago we, we saw services on the internet clearly define themselves by TCP port numbers. And as an engineer, it was easy for me to identify what was email, what was a service on, on some big fat computer somewhere and what was DNS and all the rest of it. So then it all moved across into port 80 and masqueraded as web traffic. And so the only way we could figure out one type of traffic from another was actually truly to do DPI. And that was the only way you could do it. Now things have moved across into this little app world where everything comes as a little app and sits on people's um, devices and the consumer hasn't got a hope in, in hell of seeing what it is. The operators haven't got much of a hope of, of knowing what it is unless they deliver the thing 
completely from within their networks. So unless we all go back to a nice, the nice time in the past where things clearly identified themselves as <laughs> particular things that we could then properly categorise and prioritise across the traffic in a fair way, this is going to keep on going. Uh, do you want to, anyone, does anyone want to reply? The writer is uh, the gentleman there, then uh, the gentleman there, and then Chris, I think he wants, uh, there, <laughs> there. Have I missed someone? The, the the argument against uh, enabling or p allowing for voice over IP on th the network is that uh, telcos have paid billions of dollars for spectrum and at the point when the government uh, licensed them the spectrum, there was this guarantee that they would have uh, some amount of a short business in terms of uh, domestic and international calls. Uh, how, d how, how did that play out in the rest of the world? Uh, d did the telcos not pay huge amounts for Spectrum? Or were they just willing to uh, accept that overnight things have changed completely? Because this is the fight that is currently going on, at least in India as well. Mm, does anyone want to, want to reply? I think I didn't get your question very well. He says that uh, the telcos in India claim that since they have paid a lot of spectrum money, they should be allowed the BSN networks to carry voice traffic. And if it goes over IP, and suddenly we were assured some kind of business and that we're losing out, and how has it played out in other markets? Well, I, I, how it works in Europe, we, we also have auctions for spectrum and they cost a lot of money, and they're based at member state level. Now there's a huge debate whether to do European auctions, but by now we have member states doing auctions, assigning frequencies, and uh, what, what happens normally is that the amount of money that operators give to ministries for auctions is very, very high. So we do have an argument saying that we have to recoup that investment, and so, now, we have never used that argument to say that we want to block voice over IP services, even because in Europe, since the very, very first appearances of voice over IP services, I think the European Commission has been very clear and very precise from the very beginning. We could not do it. We have had some cases of operators blocking uh, voice over IP services. There have been some antitrust and, and regulatory control. Um, I, I think the prob we have really never used the argument of, yes, we want to block mobile or voice of rapid services because we're paying a lot for auctions. We more use an argument like, let us be freer in terms of pricing structures because one of our big cost, one of our big uh, cost voice is cost of auctions. Uh, and I would agree with, uh, with, with Michele. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I do agree with you. I mean, internet is a disruptive technology indeed. So yes, there were those crazy years where operators in Europe, I remember, paid, well, billions for 3G licenses. Uh, but there is also, I mean, this is disruptive also in a favorable way for operators who continue or at a certain moment moved those to IP without specifically telling users that would continue to pay as the all-good price of PSTN. <laughs> so, so you know what? IP is a wonderful technology. There is a move to, to so many services to IP, and sometimes it's profitable, sometimes it's less. So, but that's the rule of the game. I, I, th there is, I think there is a question there. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Ki-Chang Kim. I'm from OpenNet Korea. I have a very simple, practical question. Um, I appreciate that one should tread very cautiously in this area, but assuming that some sort of regulatory intervention is needed, I want to hear the panelists' view, which of the two possible alternatives you think would be preferable? One, to teach technology to fair trade commission officials who haven't you know, had a, a high degree of technical expertise 
or to teach law to the telco oversight or telco uh, regulators. In Korea, we have Korea Telecommunications Commission who ha has a great deal of te technological expertise overseeing telco companies, but have very little trade law, fair trade co competition law expertise. And we have Fair Trade Commission who has very little technological expertise. So which alternative, in your view, would be preferable? It is true that, I mean, uh, allowing an authority that, is, uh, that has a mandate to analyze the market from a competition perspective or from a technical perspective uh, could be not efficient and something more uh, heterogeneous is uh, needed. But I think that you have a lot of replies, so please. Just some commercial uh, from the Internet Society. Uh, we have started inviting uh, guests through fellowship to the IETF uh, to make sure that uh, policymakers, regulators better understand how it works and how standards and process making standardization works. And you know what? It makes a difference and we will continue. So be there. And the next one is in London in March. Thank you. I think the difference, apart from their learning levels and possibilities, is also the nature of uh, the action these two regulatory authorities do. The trade regulators are more reactive and thin regulation, and the telecom ones are more, you know, moving, interpretative, and if you say intrusive uh, ones. And I think uh, internet uh, net neutrality needs a little more of interpretive keeping pace with proactive uh, regulation, but then guys are not comfortable with putting it to the telecom regulatory people, then you have to find some other place. But I think competition is useful, but that's not uh, enough uh, of a regulation because there are media aspects, there are human rights aspects, so something bigger is needed. So that several departments in the same authority that they, they consider the same issue in, from different perspectives could be useful. I think we have the remote uh, uh, moderator, the remote part participation uh, um, intervention right now. Uh, um, can we broadcast it? Can you hear me now? Alejandro, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes, not really well. Alejandro, can you hear us? I can hear you very well, but can you hear me well? Alejandro, can you hear me? Alejandro, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you very well, but can yes. you hear me? I hear my sound here. Yes. Okay. Uh, very briefly, this is Alejandro Pizan, Mexico City, 2.30 a.m. Uh, very glad to take part, and thank you for considering me for this participation. Uh, I'll make very brief notes. One, uh, the regulatory landscape for network neutrality uh, is varied over the world. In some places, it is looked at in a legal obligation kind of way. In other countries, it is seen as a consumer right. Or I'm sorry, Alejandro, I don't think I can read. I can, we can read your your intervention. I'm sorry, Alejandro, I don't think we can read. We can read your your uh, economic regulation. That means market for competition. And in others, it is seen as telecommunications or regulation. Uh, in many places, there is no real definition of words on this. Uh, attempts to legislate are driven by companies. I don't. I don't think we can uh, have a remote intervention anymore. Uh, okay. It's not working. Sorry. <laughs> so I think we can. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry. No, I think we can uh, keep on having an, an, an amusing uh, open uh, de debate. So please, if you have any other, I think there are other questions. So Chris, Chris, you have a question. Thanks. Uh, Chris Marsden, University of Sussex. I'll keep it brief because I'm speaking first on Friday morning, so I don't want to kind of hog two sessions. But it's actually, a, I want to share a, a remote uh, question. Um, I, actually, maybe he's in it. Rohan, are you in here or...? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why don't you ask the question about the advocates? <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's referring to a tweet. Uh, you see, uh, we were involved in a bit of a fight with uh, Ethno last year. 
uh, when they were trying to impose a very obsolete and misguided uh, charging scheme for two-sided markets where they would turn around and, uh, and uh, levy charges with ITU support from content providers. And my question was, where were the net neutrality advocates in that fight? Uh, Chris's response was that the European regulators had done the job so well that the net, net neutrality advocates uh, decided to go to sleep. Uh, but there were a few of us in the, on, on the war front, and uh, we actually won that one. Uh, I'm not an unqualified advocate of net neutrality, but uh, I think we did you some good. So if I could follow up what Rohan was saying. So in December, and, and obviously I accept that Michele is the, is the, the, the charming face of, of Etna when it comes to these things, but obviously in December we did have a scuffle about this. And my question is really developing from that, as we've seen, can we shut down the remote participation? Otherwise, this will be chaos. I know, I know. How about now? Yeah, is it better? So, given that attempted alliance between European incumbents and, uh, and developing country governments, I wonder if we're giving an unfortunate impression today, which is that net neutrality uh, regulation is so unbelievably difficult to the point of almost impossibility that actually a better idea would be to abandon that in favor of something else that would preserve uh, developing country revenues and, uh, and maintain a, a kind of balance, a telco balance, uh, when in fact we have to be much more modest about what net neutrality regulation can possibly achieve and maybe be a little bit more honest about the fact that, uh, I think that uh, Parminder mentioned this, this is a consumer intervention. This is not a competition intervention by antitrust regulators. It's a consumer intervention in favor of consumer rights, accepting that competition doesn't effectively help. And I don't just mean in Europe uh, and in uh, other places. I mean also in the United States as well. It's a consumer intervention. It's not an intervention with a competition uh, at, the, at the heart of it. It's an intervention because they've decided that there are certain minimum standards of service that consumers should be allowed to have. So I'm wondering if we're making life very complicated in the same way that it was made very complicated last December and that it leads to strange alliances that might be very unfortunate in the medium term. I think we ha uh, do you have a reply? Do you have a reply? Yeah, please. So as I said, I'm new to net neutrality, but I've been learning a lot on this panel. And the question that I've been thinking about as I'm listening to what you're saying, Chris, and what Parvinder is saying is I've been ten attending alongside uh, other panels here, the local content panels, and how to facilitate the development of local content, uh, particularly in developing countries, how to facilitate um, the upload of content for advocacy, um, political issues, etc., and how, say, tiers of service would impact on the development of local content, which we are trying to facilitate in other forums here, and also on um, kind of political advocacy, whether you're, um, say, a marginalized community in one jurisdiction trying to reach out to another through your own um, video channel or your own radio channel, how tiers of service would affect that. And this is like, I don't know, because I'm fairly new to this. It's, it is true that uh, uh, give, providing the opportunity to uh, um, discriminate certain type of content access services also can have uh, consequences on freedom of expression of uh, media plurali pluralism and uh, can also uh, uh, ascribe a sort of uh, editorial control to to ISPs, as uh, I think Pro Professor Christopher Yu uh, uh, wrote in one of his paper. Uh, I think we have a, a, a question from the remote moderators. Yeah, thank you. So uh, first of all, w one question from Carolis uh, Vinciunas from a uh, university in Lithuania. She's asking, um, self-regulation is a powerful tool to implement network neutrality. Uh, what do panelists think about it? And then uh, technical powers tell me that actually it might work for Alejandro to speak now. So if you want to try, <laughs> as you want. Okay, let's try 
to let Alejandro, Alejandro speak for the sake of freedom hear of us, expression. Please talk. Yes. Yes. Yes, I confirm. Mm -hmm. Just trying to confirm that you hear me. So, yes, um, I confirm. Just trying to confirm uh, that the situation we find, for example, in Mexico, so is yes, that the uh, telcos and ISPs are lobbying for ex-post regulations instead of ex and ISPs. Sorry, Alejandro, we are not able to, to hear you. Sorry. Could you stop this? Sorry, sorry, Alejandro, we are not able to, to hear you. Sorry. Could you stop this? Sorry, sorry, Alejandro, we are not able to hear you. Sorry. Could you stop this? We, coming back to the um, question from the remote uh, participation, uh, remote participants, um, self-regulation could be a mean to, uh, an, an efficient means to, to uh, safeguard net neutrality. Uh, does anyone uh, in the panel uh, want to, to, to provide an answer? Uh, Jeremy, you wanted to provide an answer? No? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would comment on self-regulation if somebody could make me understand what self-regulation really is. Uh, because I generally don't understand that why would somebody self-regulate after we mentioned the word having not self-regulated before we mentioned that word. I know it's about a group of companies trying to do it, but I think it's such big social issue. It can't be said that the industry does it on itself. Self-regulation has failed even in media in many countries, and this is much more complicated and variegated than media, and uh, I don't think uh, self-regulation should be uh, okay, but yes, we should have a very close contact with the industry groups trying to evolve regulatory regulation in a very participative manner. Also because it is quite uh, difficult to imagine a, a commercial entity that self-regulates to protect human rights against his commercial interests. So do you, sir? If I, I've, um, I've been working in my company for a long, num long years, like 12 years, and I've heard the word self-regulation like hundreds of times on hundreds of policy areas. I never really understand what it means either. It's normally something that we tend, to, an argument that we tend to use when we fear we will be very badly regulated in a very badly and non-efficient way. So then we come up and say, yeah, we want to self-regulate ourselves, which is a way to say, please wait, because you're doing it bad. So we do it ourselves. So I would tend to say that rather than self-regulation, maybe more cooperation during legislative processes or during control processes or during enforcement processes, better cooperation can probably um, produce mm, better outcomes than either strict enforcement or just self-regulation, which probably in certain cases just doesn't mean anything. I agree on that point. It is true that uh, regulation to cool is not the solution. Good regulation could be a solution and a re good regulation that uh, during his development process, developing process includes a lot of different stakeholders with different perspective. So instead, maybe instead of speaking about multi-stakeholderism, we should speak about hetero stakeholderism with different stakeholders, not a lot, but different that have really different point of view, different background. Other questions? Uh, Nabil, I think you were first, and then uh, the gentleman there. Thank you, Nabil Mnamar from Morocco. I'm uh, ISOC ambassador here. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, excellent panel. So uh, just uh, one uh, question. I think that uh, as far as I know, the two fathers of internet are, have no, uh, not the same point of view about uh, uh, net neutrality. Uh, Vintsov is accepting and it is with, and Bob Han is, is against and saying always that is a slogan. And I think that this is related to the quality of service. So 
uh, quality of service is needed in the, the, the internet, in all networks, and this is uh, a kind of no uh, network uh, neutrality. So how can we uh, create this balance between net neutrality and what is needed as con uh, doing some priority on, 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 on package, which is quality of service and quality of experience? Thank you. Mm, does anyone want to provide uh, a reply? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, depend what you mean by quality of service. Preserve quality by the consumer or quality of service as a guaranteed quality of service, which is not what technically the internet can provide. Internet, I mean the global internet. Maybe at local level you can guarantee some quality of service. But then it becomes the network or some networks with a control, a central control, and that's not the internet anymore. So let's let's make attention to what it is that we're talking about. So the internet still functions and quite well. Uh, take Skype or others over the top uh, OTT services. Uh, that function based on best effort. So you're using Skype every day and you got videos and sound and voice and it works. So injecting quality of services within the global internet as we know it doesn't work technically. It so, creates so much tension and uh, that might resemble a telecom network, which is not that we want. So um, quality of service at local level uh, might work, but then we come we fall into the, the special services of what Europe start talking about ASQ and this kind of stuff. So I believe we need to make this distinction. Exactly, I think it is true to, uh, first of all I would like to highlight that best effort internet does not mean uh, bad quality, it could be really good quality, and also that uh, if we need quality of service, if quality of service is needed for cer certain services, those services could be specialized services run on IP networks, separate from the open best effort internet. Uh, I think there was a, a question there, uh, the gentleman there. Thank you, uh, Arnold van Rijn, uh, Dutch government from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, I have a strong preference for uh, regulating uh, net neutrality, as we have done so in our country. Uh, the, the Netherlands is the second country in the world which uh, has put net neutrality in uh, its uh, legislation after Chile, followed by uh, Slovenia. And there are more countries uh, standing up, like Belgium, Luxembourg, within Europe. And uh, the latest, new, latest news is that uh, the European Commission has proposed uh, net neutrality, and that's based... Uh, well, uh, at great length uh, on, uh, on our model. So I would like to share with you some of the reasons why we have chosen for our legislation very shortly, if you would allow, allow me. Is yeah, please okay? do it. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. If, if, you, if it's very I'll, shortly, yes. Well, I'll read it out. That uh, saves time. Um, our legislation was, uh, was proposed when uh, our three major uh, mobile ISPs with a combined market share of about 90% has already blocked or expressed their intent to block applications such as Skype. <clears throat> the mobile ISP's argument for blocking voice over IP application was that their use came at the expense of their own voice telephony services and hence had a negative impact on their business model. Because of the negative impact on their business model, um, mobile ISPs only wanted to allow services as Skype in a more expensive subscription. So the Dutch policy that focused thus far on transparency and confidence in market forces came under pressure, especially as uh, the uh, Dutch consumers would end up in a situation of having hardly any choice in selecting a less expensive subscription, subscription with a mobile ISP that would not block uh, applications such, such as Skype. So given this uh, situation, the large public interest and the possible incentives for ISPs to further hinder competitive services in the future, now Skype, tomorrow voice over IP or IPV TV, the choice was made to draw a line between what an ISP is allowed to block or delay and what is not. So now in, in re regulation, we have uh, the firm rule that the Dutch ISP uh, may not block or delay any services or application except in a limited number of cases. And there are four exemptions. The first one is uh, when the, we have the situation of congestion. The second one, when to preserve the integrity and security of the network and the services of the provider in question of, or the terminal of the end user. The third exemption is to restrict the transmission to an end-user unsolicited communication, that is spam. And the fourth one is uh, to give effect 
uh, to a legislative provision or court order. So um, in this way, it is guaranteed that consumer can use a, um, any service they want and that service providers can innovate and do not have to fear that their services are blocked or hindered when they compete with those of the ISPs. Meanwhile, ISPs maintain the freedom to offer different subscriptions in which the charge can be based on, for example, the amount of data use or the offer speed. Well, this is in short what uh, the reasons are uh, and the content of our legislation. If you would like more information, you could uh, come to me and I'll be happy to uh, provide you with this additional information. You could also find more information on paper at the booth of Eurodig. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, per, sir, Parminder, okay, per, sorry, uh, sir, uh, Parminder wanted to know uh, who regulates, who put in, in place, who uh, applied regulation in the Netherlands. That's our Dutch uh, uh, regulator, who is uh, looking at the how 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 the law is functioning. In fact, is a telecom regulator, isn't it? Yep. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it is also true that uh, when uh, the, uh, the Dutch Parliament decided to uh, to pass this law, it was also because a specific uh, IS, a telecom operator told that he wanted to monetize uh, free uh, internet applications. So it's we can understand the reasons. And also, thank you for having led the debate from architectures to norms. So, uh, if anyone else has a question in the room, no questions. So we are, uh, I think it's maybe the time for final remarks because we just have three minutes. So I would like to ask to the panelists to uh, provide some uh, final thoughts and maybe some suggestion for some uh, principles or some uh, elements that, are, uh, that could be needed in a, for a good regulation, not just for regulation. We have understood that uh, a, re a regulation could be needed, but we, what we know is that a good regulation is needed. So if, if the, that regulation should be elaborated, uh, how could be elaborated and uh, what could be the content, some elements? Uh, Parminder, do you want to start? I think we just got a few minutes. I will be short. Uh, one is, I think, uh, the use of the term public internet rather than the best effort internet would make it much more clearer to the wider public. And I think the U.S. Regulation, regulation also uses the term public internet. So we know that there is this public internet and there are the specialized services. And that should be a separation. Secondly, I just want people to take this issue in a wider human rights and social choices framework and not just in competition frameworks. And I think you... This is important. Now, Jeremy was saying it doesn't matter perhaps so much if somebody has a free Facebook. But think of it. Some people are caught in a free social media, which is very extensive. And you have soon a time when most of the political conversation takes place on such a media. And huge number of people have uh, controlled access to certain political information. And close to an election, you could suddenly find so much influence being put through that and that is not a time you'll be able to pull it back so you have to think in advance that the social media remains diverse enough and for it to remain diverse it has to be imposed as a social choice the consumer at this time would not be able to think 10 years ahead and say okay one day there would be election and i wouldn't want to be subject to certain kind of homogenized political information so i think we need to be looking at human rights media rights cultural rights uh, educational rights, collective economic rights kind of frameworks, and that's why it needs to come out both from the trade uh, enforce, trade rules enforcement and competition law enforcement authorities, and also out of telecom technical thinking into some kind of a human rights oriented net neutrality thinking and a special regulator for that purpose. Thank you. Um. I think uh, it's not easy to define uh, some uh, definition, such as specialized services and managed services and the neutrality, and uh, what is uh, exemption from the uh, neutrality. Uh, so I think uh, it depends on the uh, every conditions of every nation's diversity. I think uh, so. 
uh, I think it's very important to uh, keep uh, the democratic ways uh, to make rules and, uh, uh, for example, trans keep transparency and open process. Uh, so I think uh, the human right, uh, uh, so we developed the concept uh, of and the user's right as a fundamental human right. So uh, it can make uh, the in future of internet uh, will be uh, 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 the for people and the world. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we've seen a push for transparency for the private sector in particular, and the burden of accountability resting with the government in this discussion or with regulatory agencies uh, of different sorts. Where, whereas I think that both of them should be considered for all parties involved in this. And maybe we could also just think of involving the end users much more and maybe providing them with online tools of monitoring the kind of um, net neutrality practices that their ISPs are um, putting in place. Something to consider for the future. Thanks, sir. All right, I'll just echo what Pavinder has said, that I like the term public interest. Um, as a part of how we consider net neutrality, um, greater transparency. From the libraries and educators' perspective, it would be very much about ensuring that your access to information, whether you're going through a public library or a community college, is not uh, affected by uh, you don't have a different quality of service. Um, I would like to uh, again, repeat what I said at the very beginning in the first presentation. I, from an EU perspective, once uh, we have sorted out a good framework on the consumer side, a good framework on the supply side in terms of obligations of ISPs to be transparent and to inform um, customers of uh, how we manage traffic, and once we have given uh, a good level of uh, policy, background, uh, and norms uh, for good cooperation uh, in, of different players around the value chain, uh, I think we can consider the net neutrality debate as probably something we really have to get over. Thank you. Yes, um, um, four little points. First, uh, um, I'm glad to see that um, the conversation has so much matured. No bird names around this table or with the audience. Great. Meaning that we all agree on strong basic principles. And that would be much more transparency, access, choice, including the, the ability to switch or easily switch for consumers to, to, to another uh, competitor. And of course, that means competition. And this is not a done deal, including in Europe. Let's, let's make it clear. Um, um, uh, three... Um, uh, I, I would say that there are some concerns right now in Europe, but it remains highly speculative. We still don't know how it will work. And in the US, we are at the same level. We still don't know how the consistence of specialist services and the global internet as we know it will happen. And this call for my fourth point, that would be um, we need a strong cooperation between whoever will monitor quality and perception of consumers and telcos, because it's an extremely complex issue. We haven't addressed it, uh, but it's extremely complex. So telcos will have to cooperate with NRAs. And then my last point, users have right, and, and they should be mobilized here and better informed. And users should be able to continue to ask their ISPs what it is that you're doing with my connection. Thank you. Uh, I agree with uh, many of the points the other panelists have made, such as um, that transparency and choice are uh, very important values for consumers. But I also want to reiterate that uh, not all uh, net neutrality issues can be treated homogeneously. Uh, we have to do a bit more research into which cause the most consumer harm and which are the most anti-competitive and uh, to direct enforcement resources appropriately. Um, and uh, I think another good uh, sign of progress in this debate is um, the formation of the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality and the work that it's been doing towards the development of principles which we can all agree on. And the more diverse that coalition can become, the better, um, because then we can work towards a multi-stakeholder consensus rather than just a single policy position. 
Thanks a lot, and uh, uh, I'm glad to see that almost every point that has been raised is in the model framework that you will find in the report. <laughs> And <laughs> and so I will just uh, I will excuse myself for the delay because we are finishing with five minutes of delay. But well, we have uh, started with uh, a couple of minutes of delay. Thanks a lot for this uh, excellent debate, and uh, I hope I will see you on Friday morning at nine for the report.